Well, we're going to be talking about the story of Jonah today. Some great observations that could be helpful to us. The book of Jonah has raised some eyebrows because people have a hard time swallowing the story of the fish that swallowed Jonah. Truth of the matter is, there's been documented accounts through history where actually people were swallowed by a whale. And uh, one in France, they were har a harpoonist, fell into the water where they were trying to take this great whale for the blower. Back then they did that. And the whale. One man drowned from the overcapsized, and the other just went missing. Well, when they captured the whale and was taking the blubber from the whale, <laughs> they found the missing guy in the whale. And he was a little dazed and uh, needed to clean it up a little bit. <laughs> but he was, uh, after he kind of came to his senses, he was okay. So it's, it is documented that that has actually happened. I heard one interesting story. They said, oh, I just don't believe that that really happened in the book of Jonah. And the guy says, well, you don't think that God could do such a thing and make that happen? And he says, man can put a hundred men inside of a big fish called a submarine. And they can live underwater for year. And if man can do that, surely God can prepare a great fish. In fact, people refer to the story of Jonah and the whale, but in the Hebrew and in the Greek both, it does not translate whale. It translates that God prepared a sea monster, a very large fish. And the more proper translation of the Hebrew and the Greek would be sea monster, something that maybe nobody's ever quite seen quite that large. But it is an interesting story that has a lot of good truth. Now, there's a lot of different applications you can take from that story, but I just picked out some for us to look at today that could be an encouragement to us. Learning from the sins of a deeply religious man. Um, let's ask the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your word that is so inspiring and it teaches us so many things. These stories of the Bible are amazing. And this one in particular. Speak to us through this story. Only four chapters. But God, it speaks volumes of lessons for us to choose from today and learn from. And we give you thanks and give you praise. Everybody said amen. amen. The book of Jonah is a lot more than the story of the big fish or other parts of it. The book of of Jonah is about God's concern for hurting sinful people. That's what it's about, really. The Jews, uh, on the other hand, had become quite clever and prosperous over the years from keeping the Mosaic Law. You see, when we obey God's word, there can be a lot of benefits from that. And the Jewish people benefited from keeping the Mosaic law, and they actually prospered from keeping the Mosaic law. There was a, another issue, though. The Jewish people, it, it almost comes across, and we see it in this story a little bit as well, they wanted to keep the revelation of God, of the prophets, to themselves. And, uh, you know, it don't take much for pride, uh, spiritual pride, you know. Well, I'm a, I'm a Methodist. I'm going to be a Methodist. I'm a 
Pentecostal or charismatic or I'm a Baptist. And I heard one person said he was church of God and he was always going to be church of God and when he died they're going to stretch his skin on a drum and they're going to beat him for the church of God. But anyway, we become sometimes kind of prideful about what we think is important or not. But the Jewish people did somewhat pride themselves because God had spoken through their prophets and God had revealed himself to the Jewish people. You've got to understand that was a big deal, a big thing. So let's look at some of the things that are going to be interesting uh, about this deeply religious man named Jonah. The story of a man of God who heard a word from God and his struggle to accept it and obey it. Um, does anybody think that sounds a little familiar? Even in our time. God commissioned Jonah but Jonah's stubbornness and rebellion. Jonah was asked in verse 2 of chapter 1, Arise and go to Nineveh. And Nineveh was quite a city of the Assyrians. It was one of the greatest cities of antiquity. The greatest that ever was. 60 miles in circumference. 1,200 towers around the walls of the city. 1,200 towers standing 200 feet tall. 1,200 towers around the city of Nineveh. Walls five or six feet thick. You could walk on. It was quite a, quite a place. 500 to 600,000 people. Now in the, in the four chapters, you'll see a figure of 120,000 that's mentioned, but that was speaking of just children, just children alone. But 500,000 to 600,000 people in the general population. God commissioned Jonah and Jonah's stubbornness and rebellion. Arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah never once doubted God's existence, but he gave in to his own feelings, unwilling to obey, and he ran from God's command. More willing to drown at sea than to do the will of God. Man! Now, you see, God revealed himself to the Jewish people, but after a while, they became also a stiff-necked people. I mean, those who are talking about that, a very stiff-necked, they're referred to as a stiff-necked, stubborn people. Well, Jonah had a number of reasons that people think why he resisted so much. The Assyrians were becoming a threat to Israel, so that was an issue. Uh, some scholars say that Jonah was a nationalist. He was very nationalist-minded, and he had no use for the Assyrians, and very prideful of his Hebrew heritage. Some people look at that in the commentary. How many knows that it's pretty bad when you're more willing to die by drowning in the sea than to do the will of God? Mercy. That's going pretty far. But I had Joan put this in bold. We all are we all are at times tempted to run away from our God-given responsibilities because we want to play it safe, unchallenged. We too have heard the word of the Lord 
And the big question is, are we running towards it in obedience? Or are we running away from it in disobedience? That is the question, right? To be or not to be? Was Elizabeth in the morning? <coughs> I know I look back at my life when I ran towards obedience and I also look at the times which are sad that I would sometimes run away from being obedient to what God had spoken. Listen, running away from God and his word that he speaks to us is never a good idea. It is never an upward move, and it's never an onward move. It always turns out to be a downward move. Somebody say amen. Downward. My father, I give him credit for this, because when I was a teenager, he preached on this, and this is what he said. So I'm quoting my father, basically, many years ago. He said, Jonah went down to Java, down to the ship, down to the bottom of the ship to rest and be to himself, down into the water, down into the belly of the great fish, in other words, a real downer. How many have known people to run from God? We've known people in our families and our friends and different people maybe we've observed and it is true rebellion and stubbornness is uh, is quite a thing quite a sin that Jonah committed against the Lord um, there was times that I was a little bit uh, rebellious and stubborn my mama knew how to do an attitude adjustment real quick on me she was really good at that Mr. George and sometimes I think God wants to do an attitude adjustment for us, Jerry. All of us. This is, this is kind of scary here. First Samuel. Uh, Samuel's talking to Saul now in this passage. He says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Come on, this is serious stuff here. Are we... <laughs> Self-will and stubbornness is an iniquity and an idolatry. And he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, God is speaking through Samuel, he has rejected you from being king, Saul. Stubbornness is an intractable spirit that refuses to believe and obey God's word. And when you read that, about uh, stubbornness and rebellion, that's pretty sobering stuff. I mean, you know, it really is. Kind of scary, really. And I, I do believe that one of our prayers from what we read about Jonah's life here is that we really do need to make sure we run towards God, not away from God. And be open in our hearts and be pliable uh, play those silly those you know you can sort of form it any way you want to do it that's kids love that and I used to play with my kids with that bought them some of that stuff we need to be that way with God where he can shape us and form us and David sort of says we need to take a trip to the potter's house where the potter master potter has the vessel on the wheel and he's forming the vessel. And wouldn't it be odd if while the master potter is working on that potter's wheel and he's forming this beautiful vessel of clay, wouldn't it be kind of odd for that vessel to speak out and say, no, I don't want a handle there. Or I don't like that shape. No. And it does go on to say when he went to the Jeremiah, went to the potter's house, that the the vessel was marred in the hands of the potter, but not by the hands of the potter, which is quite another story within itself. God commissioned Jonah, and then we 
we see his stubbornness and rebellion. Jonah is tempted to forget and deny the power of God. The miraculous power of God is so clear in it. These four chapters, every episode, every chapter of this book is a, is a miraculous thing that God did. God sent the wind. He prepared the fish. God made it possible for Jonah to stay alive in the fish. God caused the great fish to throw him up. God prepared the gourd vine. It's amazing that the, the fish obeyed God's voice quicker than Jonah did. God prepared this gourd vine. God prepared a worm to destroy the vine. But Jonah either ignored, overlooked, or denied the very power of God. I think we always have to remind ourselves that no matter what the situation is, we cannot, re we cannot deny and we cannot overlook that God is the God of miracles and power. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, he gives us a warning to those of us living in the last days. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, turn away. And then he also says, those people, those Sadducees, don't know the word of God, and they are in error because they don't know the power of God. It's sinful to, to, to deny the power of God. For real. Jonah is tempted to forget and deny the power of God. And on your back side of your sheet, Jonah's half-heartedness towards the call of God. You see it through the whole thing. But chapter 3 records what happened to Jonah after the great fish gave him up. Some people call him the upchuck prophet. Or maybe, I think Dave Wilkerson called him. I remember being in, uh, in uh, Kansas City here, and Dave Wilkerson preached to 20,000 ministers. And he preached on the seaweed prophet and had all those ministers coming down repenting by the end of the service, including me. Amazing sermon he gave on the seaweed prophet, John. came unto Jonah a second time. Arise and go. He was dragging his feet, kicking and screaming all the way. I think one good comparison, you see, Jonah knew about Elisha, and we went to the, the theater in the uh, Amish country last year, saw the Jonah, the play. It was really great. If anybody get the opportunity to go to that great theater there in Lancaster County, they're doing Jesus this year, and I'd really like to go back. It is, they have 600 people that run that place, and they have over a million people come through a year to, the, to do plays there, Christian plays. Uh, amazing, absolutely amazing. But uh, and in that play, it illustrated that the Hebrew people hadn't heard, or the prophets hadn't heard a word from God for a number of years. And Jonah, all of a sudden, God speaks to him. And he's so excited. Oh, wow, God is speaking again to me. And then a little bit later, when he starts thinking about what God told him to do, then his enthusiasm sort of went out the window, you know. He wasn't so excited then. And he knew about Elisha. When you compare Jonah and Elisha, Jonah, the, I call him the half-hearted prophet, but Elisha, he was, he wouldn't leave Elijah's side. He stayed there right with him. He would not leave. And, and, and Elisha said, I need the double portion, God. Elisha was the sold-out prophet, and Jonah was the half-hearted prophet. What a, what a comparison. Listen, you will never achieve, we will never achieve God's best by being half-hearted towards the things of God. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, it's true. Jonah's half-heartedness towards the call of God was somewhat evident throughout the story. And Jonah 
developed a hard heart. Jonah had been forgiven for breaking his vows, yet he would not proclaim forgiveness to the Assyrians. As a prophet, Jonah had vowed that he would proclaim the word of the Lord. He would proclaim it and not try to change it. I've seen people in my ministry where they take the word of God and if they saw something they didn't like, they just change it. You can't do that. Either God says it or he doesn't say it. And he is what it is. And uh, we don't change it. And, 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 and listen, with Jonah developing this hard heart, working in church work, working in the ministry, it's real easy. I mean, it's real easy to become cynical and hard-hearted. Working with people, working with situations, it can happen just, just like that. I've seen ministers become so bitter over bad experiences and you know, they go to a church and things don't work out too well and they think people are hard on them and they go through hard experiences and, you know, and I, I talked to some of those ministers. Listen, you know, my mother burned biscuits when I was a kid, but I still eat biscuits. There was one morning she burned them up. But just because you have a burnt situation doesn't mean you don't enjoy good things later. If you have a bad experience, you get up and you ask God to wash off. He said, when you go to that house, two by two, and you go to a house and they don't accept you, you go out there and you kick the dust off your feet before you go to the next house. Because if you carry that bitterness to the next house, you're not going to be worth anything again for anybody. You've got to get rid of those negative, nasty things that you feel like were against you. You can't, let, you can't become hard-hearted. You can't become cynical doing God's work. Next, Jonah became angry with God and questioned the wisdom of God. In verse 1 of chapter 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. He was angry. Jonah thought he knew better than God. Hello? How many times have we thought we knew better than God? Listen, he knew the authentic voice of God. He just didn't want to obey it. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, he wanted what God wanted. They both wanted the same thing. But he just couldn't trust God. And what Jonah wanted and what God wanted was no more violence and war, no more invasion of Israel from the Assyrians. And from this great revival in Nineveh, Israel's freedom was secured for generations. But Jonah just couldn't trust God in that. Do you know that the revival of Nineveh has been recognized by scholars as the greatest revival ever recorded in the history of of mankind. You'll see that in commentary. The whole, the whole, the whole, all of them, the whole country, the whole empire repented. All of them, from the greatest to the smallest. It was an amazing thing. But Jonah was angry with God and questioned God's wisdom. And I said that was the weirdest thing about it. Jonah wanted exactly the same thing that God wanted. He just couldn't trust God that he would bring it about. Jonah's prayer of repentance and deliverance. Now this prayer of repentance and deliverance is a prayer prayed in the past tense. Now, I know he was pretty crying out to God while in the fish. But I don't think he had a tablet to write on in the fish. He didn't take his iPad in there with him. But uh, Jonah's prayer in essence is he I'm 
unto the Lord his God, I cried out of my affliction, out of the belly of hell, and he heard me. Thou hast cast me into the deep floods, compass me, billows and waves pass over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again towards the holy temple. The waters compass me about to the throat. Seaweeds entangle my head. I was sinking into a world whose bars would hold me fast forever. Yet thou brought me up my life from the pit. Amazing. Jonah was so reluctant to acknowledge the grace and mercy of God to the Assyrians. I said Jonah was so reluctant to proclaim the grace, mercy, and goodness of God to the Assyrians but he needed it very much himself and did receive that himself. Mark Batterson, I put something on this for you in the closing. He has a book called Whisper, speaking, teaching and talking about hearing from God. And one, one word that he put there that I put on our notes for today, most of us read the Bible with the wrong way, he says, with low expectation. I read it with the core conviction, if I do what they did in the Bible, God will do what he'll do. Why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'll, he said, Mark says, I'll take it one step further. We'll do even greater things. Do we need to hear from his voice any less? Do we need fewer miracles? Do we need fewer gifts? Do we need fewer signs? Do we need fewer doors open and closed? The answer is no, 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 no. And then he finishes that. And may God sanctify our expectations. So they're on par with what the scripture says. Amen. Listen. It's, a, it's an amazing thing of the time in which we live. There's a lot of things happening. Uh, David Jeremiah mentioned this morning, he gave a great message on Daniel, by the way. He is really a great preacher. He quoted this morning that in the next 84 months, 55,000 churches are going to close in America. 55,000 churches are going to close in the next 84 months in the U.S. It's missionologists, people that know this stuff, is given this statistical readout. What I'm saying today is we and America and churches like ours who are small, we need to hear the voice of God. We need to hear something from the Lord that will change our situation. Do you believe that? Learning from the sins of a deeply religious man named Noah. Wow, let's stand again.